Live, this is Jill Curry from Red Hill and my friend Russell the Rabbit. Now Russell loves Bible stories and because he's so clever he decided to come and help me with this story. Okay so he's going to check up on what I say all right because at the end of the story we're going to have a test and Russell and I are going to test you with some questions. Now our story today is taken from a book called First Samuel. And it's the story of Hannah, who was the mother of Samuel. Do you remember that, Russell? You've heard the story of Hannah. Do you know it? So you can test the children. Good. Right. So I'm going to read you from my children's Bible. And then I want you to listen carefully to the story. And then I'm going to ask you some questions. And the story's called A Baby for Hannah. Are you ready, Russell? Are you going to read with me? Okay, good. When the people of Israel had settled in Canaan, the gold covenant chest, the most precious object in God's tent, was placed in the care of the priests at a place called Shiloh. The people used to visit Shiloh to bring presents to God and celebrate together. Elkanah was an Israelite who brought his family to Shiloh every year. He had two wives, Peninnah, who had children, and Hannah, who had none. What? Yes, he had two wives. Two, yes, one this side and one that side. Okay. And it was okay. In those days, they did sometimes have two wives. It, it did cause a few problems, but that's how they lived. Can we carry on? Okay. Hannah longed desperately for a child of her own. Cheer up, Hannah, Elkanah would say. I love you. Doesn't that help? But Hannah did not cheer up. When Hannah kept, when Peninnah kept teasing and taunting her and showing off her own boys and girls. That was really mean, wasn't it, Russell? That Peninnah teased her and teased her and she was mean. And what do you want to do? Are you crying? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It gets better. The story gets better. You can come up. It's okay. Right. Hannah dreaded the annual expedition to Shiloh. These were happy family times and Peninnah took care to see that Hannah felt miserable and left out. One year, Hannah could bear it no longer. That means, Russell, that she'd had enough. When they sat down for the special family meal, she should only pick at the food. She slipped away from the table and went to the door of the shrine where the covenant chest was kept. And she began to pray and she cried and cried as she prayed. Are you crying in sympathy? Yes, okay. And the tears rolled down her cheeks. Please don't forget me, God, she begged. I'm so unhappy. I want a child so badly. If you'll give me one, I'll promise that I will give him back to serve you all his life long. Someone was watching Hannah. Eli, the old priest, was sitting at the door, wondering whatever was wrong with this woman. Russell, what do you think was wrong with her? You think she might be sick? No, it wasn't sick. Eli thought she was drunk. That means she'd had lots and lots of wine. You know, but Eli thought perhaps she'd drunk too much wine at the feast. He went down to talk to her. I'm not drunk, Hannah told Eli. Only very sad and very upset. I've asked God to help me. Then go in peace, Eli said, and may God answer your prayer. Well, Hannah went back to the party and back to Elkanah, feeling peaceful and almost happy. Isn't that good? Isn't that good, Russell? She felt so much better when she prayed. She even felt hungry again. And she went and had some nice food and some nice cheese and some carrots. You like carrots, don't you? Definitely. And all the way home, her heart seemed lighter. She got told God her trouble and now she would wait for his answer. 
And you know what, children? God answered her prayer. Because a few months later, a baby boy called Samuel was born. Now, we need to talk back about the story because we've gone through the story now and Russell and I are going to give you a test, okay? So Russell's going to give me each question that he wants you, me to test you with, okay? So what's the first question? Russell says, who are the people in the story? Well, it was Hannah and Peninnah and Elkanah and Eli and a baby boy called Samuel. That's right. Okay, Russell, what's the next question? How does Hannah feel? Well, she was very sad. There was something she wanted so badly. She wanted a baby. And sometimes, children, there are things that you want really, really badly. Maybe you want to pass an exam. Maybe you need, want to change school. Maybe you want to see your dad come home or something like that. I don't know. But I do know that sometimes people want things very, very badly. Okay, next one. How did Elkanah feel? Hmm. Well, he thought just loving Hannah would make everything better. He didn't understand that even though she loved him, he couldn't fill that longing that she had, could he? No. No. And one more question. Why did Hannah go to the temple? Okay. Hannah went to the temple because she was going to pray. Because that was where people contacted God and where they prayed. And when Hannah went to the temple and she met Eli, she had prayed and she had asked God about her problem and he helped her and he answered her prayer. Wasn't that amazing, Russell? Definitely, definitely. Okay, now we're going to show the children some craft. Bye. Okay, children of God, now it's craft time. Now, Russell, I'm going to have to put you down, okay, because your paws are not able to do craft. Are you okay? Can I put you down? Okay, I'll pick you up later when we say goodbye. Children, the story of Hannah talks about when we want something really badly. And when we want something really badly, the best thing to do is actually talk to God about it. Even if you're not sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, go and talk to God anyway. But there are many ways that we can talk to God. You know, some people would say, well, go and kneel down by the bed, and that's great, or you could write. But another way to talk to God is to take something squishy and soft, and you could, this is prestic, but you could use anything. You could use some Play-Doh that you made, or you could use some plasticine, or you're going to get some mud if you want. Anything works. And what we're going to do is I want you to think about what is the thing that you really want to talk to God about? What is it that you want? What do you, what do you want him to answer? And I want you to take your squishy stuff and make it into a shape that represents what you want and talks about what you want. So maybe you're hurting. So maybe you could just squeeze that corner a bit just to show God you're hurting. Or maybe you want something to go away so you could squish it in like that. Or you could, maybe you want to make things smoother in your life. So you could roll it round in your hands. And that represents being smoother. Or maybe you could stretch it out to show sometimes that life can be frustrating and it stretches you. And then I want you just, just to sit down and show God this little thing that you've made and talk to him about it and we're going to pray together. See mine's just broken but the nice thing about this stuff is you can squidge it back together and start again. So we're going to take my shape and we're going to just pray and I've put it into a little shape that represents something that I care about very much. I made a little square here. Can you see? I'm going to 
Okay, I'm just a little square and we're going to pray together and you can do this later today or if you manage to find something quickly while I'm doing this, we can do it together. So let's pray. Father, we come before you and we know what this represents. You know what this represents. And we ask you please to take care of this. You understand what we need. You understand how we feel, just like you understood how Hannah felt. That nobody really understood how much she wanted a baby, except you. And yet we can come to you with our love and our prayers and our needs and our thoughts and everything that that means. Because we can trust you and give it to you. And we can do this through Jesus' name. Amen. And then the lovely thing we're going to do, because now you know this prayer has gone to God, we don't need to worry about this anymore. And we can take this little thing and we can just squash it back to the way it was, nice and flat, because it's gone. And God has heard it and it's done. And we can be sure that God will answer. He will answer in a way that is best for us, that is good for us, but this means he has heard our prayer. So Russell's just going to come and say goodbye because he loves these stories. Hang on a second. There he is. He's back again and he's going to say goodbye to you and we'll see you soon. Bye. Goodbye, children. See you again. Good morning, everyone. Today's call to worship will be taken from Psalm 16. The best choice. Protect me, Lord God. I have run to you for safety, and I have said, Only you are my Lord. Every good thing I have is a gift from you. Your people are wonderful, and they make me happy. But worshippers of other gods will have much sorrow. I refuse to offer sacrifices of blood to those gods or worship in their name. You, Lord, are all I want. You are my choice, and you keep me safe. You make my life pleasant, and my future is bright. I praise you, Lord, for being my guide. Even in the darkest nights, your teachings fill my mind. I will always look to you as I stand beside me. And protect me from fear. With all my heart I will celebrate and I can safely rest. I am chosen. You won't leave me in the grave or let my body decay. You have shown me the path of life and you make me glad by being near to me. Sitting at your right side I will always be joyful. Good morning and welcome to everyone. This is the 25th Sunday after Pentecost. We are nearing the end of the Christian calendar. Soon we will be uh, starting the Advent season. Uh, before we start the service, I just want to uh, welcome everyone who's joining us for the first time. We trust that you'll enjoy uh, this service with us. But also just to remind everyone that we are having uh, the National Church Board meeting next weekend. So please pray for a successful meeting, uh, which is taking place next week. Um, and we are now going to go into uh, the service our service will follow the normal process. Uh, we'll start with the opening prayer, which will be followed by the worshipping songs. And then after that, we'll have uh, uh, the speaking of life. And then we'll have the message on giving, after which we'll have the scripture reading for the day. And then we'll have the message for the day, followed by the last song and then the blessing. So thank you once again for joining us. Let's go into the service. Uh, we'll start with the opening prayer. Please bow your heads for the prayer. Lord God, we come before you this morning. We humble ourselves at your feet, Lord Jesus, and we take this moment to remember you, to thank you, Father God, for all that you've given us, Lord Jesus, and all that you've done for us, Father. I pray, Lord, that you are there with us, Lord Jesus, throughout this festive season, Lord, that you protect us and you go with us wherever we may be, Lord whether it's with family, whether it's traveling, Lord, or even if it's just to be at home. 
I pray, Father God, your blessing and your protection about anyone and everyone, Father God, during this time. I thank you, Lord, for being there with us through the duration of this year. And I pray, Lord, that you continue to walk with us and be with us, Father God. I thank you, Father, for this morning. I thank you, Lord, for those who are here today. We pray, Lord, a blessing upon this session. We pray a blessing upon our union with you and for us to be in community with you, Father God. I thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for the blessing. I thank you, Father, for being you and for all that you've done and all that you will continue to do in our lives. I thank you, Lord. In your mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen.
One of the most famous story plots in history is the tale of the underdog. From the oldest story of the slave who turns out to be royalty to the modern sports movie about the unlikely heroes who never let go of their dreams, we resonate with those on the bottom. A narrative about a child of privilege who simply goes on to be an adult of privilege would be less interesting than a grocery list. There has to be loss, risk, a tightrope the underdog finally makes it across into the promised land. This story resonates with all of us no matter our background. Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel, was one of these biblical underdogs. She suffered from barrenness, which was a great stigma in the ancient world. When she was finally blessed with a child, she sang her famous prayer. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has born seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The underdog theme. The upside downness of God's miraculous work runs throughout it. The weak become the strong, the barren are pregnant, the poor are brought from the back alleys to the head table. Throughout redemptive history, this story appears again and again. God confounds our strata with who matters, who's important, who's powerful. The underdog becomes the superhero. The same kind of song is picked up centuries later by another underdog. 
He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. This is the Magnificat, the song Mary sings early in her pregnancy with Jesus. She's an unwed teenage mom from a country backwater. She couldn't be more of an underdog, and she becomes the most famous woman in history, and God uses her to confound the world. And so we see that still at work in our lives. God uses the least likely to break his kingdom into the world. How many times have we been thrown off by a child or a person with special needs and reminded of life's fragility and beauty? How many times have we seen God speak through a person who seems to offer nothing else? God not only loves the underdog, but through the centuries, he often plays his song of life through the least likely instruments. Are we listening? I'm Greg Williams, speaking of life. Good morning. Our scripture reading for this morning's offertory is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 8 from verses 1 to 9. Our brothers and sisters, we want you to know what God's grace has accomplished in the churches in Macedonia. They have been severely tested by the troubles they went through, but their joy was so great that they were extremely generous in their giving, even though they are very poor. I can assure you that they gave as much as they could and even more than they could of their own free will. They begged us and pleaded for the privilege of having a part in helping God's people in Judea. It was more than they could have helped for, hoped for. First they gave themselves to the Lord and then by God's will they gave themselves to us as well. So we urged Titus, who began this work, to continue it and help you complete the special service of love. You are so rich in all you have, in faith, in speech, and in knowledge, in your eagerness to help, and in your love for us. And so we want you to be generous also in the service of love. I am not laying down any rules, but by showing you how eager others are to help, I'm trying to find out how real your own love is. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, rich as he was, he made himself poor for our sake, in order to make you rich by means of his poverty. In verses 5, we see how the brothers and sisters first gave themselves to the Lord. Giving begins with the heart and not with our money. God always makes the first move. We are the receivers always. And even if we give it, it is because we first received grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. The motive of our heart matters to God. Joyful giving honors God because it is a way of saying, Lord, we love you so much that we want to give to support those things that matter most to you. All that we believe about us giving must begin with the truth that giving is an act of grace. We receive grace and we give grace in the form of our offerings. For many of us, you could say COVID-19 has been a severe trial with job losses, sicknesses, and even death and bills piling up for many of us. But we give because we are fully committed to Christ, our hearts made free by full surrender to the Lord. Giving is not only about money, Giving is also of our time, picking up and giving lifts to others so that they too can enjoy fellowship with the brethren. The various ministries and other resources are all acts of offerings to the things that matter to God. This is the pattern of grace, of giving. Grace stands at the bottom of all that we do as Christians. We love him because he first loved us, for God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. John 3.16. Let us pray. 
Father, we thank you so much this morning for the offerings. We thank you, eternal God, for our hearts are freely made to give you generously, Lord, even as we surrender to your love. And help us continually, Father God, to be grateful and to have a heart of gratitude. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Good morning everyone. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 1 from verse 4 to verse 20. Let us read. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he will give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Anna went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Anna, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Anna stood up. Now early, the priest was sitting on a chair by the, by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, wonderful and a privilege to share God's word with you all today. As you heard from the scripture, the story is about Hannah. The story of Samuel begins very quietly, not with a great warrior on to coming onto the scene, but with the faithful prayer of a woman who wants to be a mother. The underlying message of the book of Samuel, as in other places in the Bible, that faith and trust in God are more important than any trust we place in human beings, even powerful human beings. As Hannah prays for a child, she has absolute faith in God's plan and her willingness to be a part of it, however she can. Without her faith, there can be no story. 
But in, as in all stories, there is a backstory, a context, a background. Hannah's life had not been easy or very happy. Every story has a plot. As we heard from Greg Williams, the plot in this story is about the underdog. Yes, you know, the one, Rags to Riches, and we love those stories where people come up from nothing. In our scripture today, we find that Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel, was one of these biblical underdogs. She couldn't have children. But God has turned many a life upside down. His miraculous work is shown in the theme of the underdog. You know, the weak become strong, the barren are pregnant, the underdog becomes the superhero. We're reminded again and again that God's ways are not our ways. God is continually challenging our understanding of what is important, who is important and who is powerful. We heard on the Speaking of Life, and this is what Greg said on that programme there, we see that still at work in our lives. God uses the least to break his kingdom into the world. How many times have we been thrown off by a child or a person with special needs and reminded of life's fragility and beauty? How many times have we seen God speak through a person who seems to offer nothing else? God not only loves the underdog, but through the centuries he often plays his song of life through the least likely instruments. Are we listening? Kalpana Saraj was born into poverty in India and married off at the age of 12. She lived in a slum in Mumbai with her husband's family. After suffering terrible physical abuse at the hands of his, her husband's family members, Saraj tragically took poison in order to remove herself from her challenging life. She was rescued by her father, left her husband, returned to her village to live with her parents. Luckily, she survived and she overcame, thanks to her father removing her from the marriage. Siraj moved to a different town where she was able to start a new life. And she helped provide for her family while working 16 hours a day, which is a habit she still maintains to this day. With the small amount of money that she was able to pull together, Siraj slowly began building an empire from the bottom up. And she is now a multi-millionaire. Rags to riches. We love it. Now Hannah's story is not one of rags to riches, but of being the underdog to those around her who should have loved her and protected her. Her story is a familiar biblical one. It is that of a barren woman longing for a child and also part of the ongoing saga of human desires. All humans desire things. Personally, I went through a time of longing for a baby. It's a long, long time ago now. The clock was ticking. John had been studying. We didn't want to start a family until he'd finished and qualified. And when we thought we were ready, we were both 27, we were ready and waiting. Nothing happened. For us, it meant round after round of fertility treatment. There was hope, but every month came that awful disappointment. What happens is that you begin to think about nothing else. It consumes you and you become dysfunctional. Long story short, someone introduced me to Jesus and the miracle happened. I wonder now, thinking back, why was a baby so important? In Hannah's day, the social constructs were very different from today. There was shame in not being able to produce a baby, especially a son. The community looked down on women who were barren. What a horrible word it is. We think of a, a barren desert, but the human being, oh, it's a terrible word, and never ever was the man ever considered to be the problem. But it wasn't only the community that hurt and demeaned Hannah. Elkanah seemed irritated by Hannah's constant longing for her son. Am I not more to you than ten sons, he said in verse 8. Now many scholars read these words as proof of Elkanah's deep love for Hannah. After all, he, he provides for her, he protects her and he loves her, even though God had closed her womb. But these words from Elkanah seem to be about him, his vision of the world, his worldview, with no real understanding of his wife's emotional and spiritual world. The trouble is that his words are like a double-edged sword. They express his deep and clearly shown love the way he provides for Hannah, and on the other side, his inability to understand how inconsolable she feels about her affliction of barrenness. 
His love, it would seem, is passionate in spite of her inability to produce an heir. But the fact was, the ultimate success of a woman in a patriarchal society was an heir. And Elkanah had already had children. Thus the answer is no. He is not better than ten sons because her honour and security are tied to childbearing. And then there was abuse from Penina who mocked her mercilessly because she couldn't fall pregnant. Listen to these words from the Living Bible, verses 6 and 7. Penina made matters worse by taunting Hannah because of her barrenness. Every year it was the same. Penina scoffing and laughing at her as they went to Shiloh, making her cry so much Hannah couldn't eat. And then there was Eli, who thought that Hannah was drunk when she was praying. This is a triple whammy. She suffered misunderstanding from her husband. In her grief, she was mocked by the other wife, and Elkanah didn't stop it. And Eli mistook her behaviour and judged her. Poor Hannah. Hannah's problem is a familiar one in the saga of the birth of Israel, where a barren woman with a fertile woman married to the same man are in conflict because of their childbearing status. Remember Leah and Rachel, Genesis 29. Sarai and Hagar, Genesis 16 and 21, for example. And Penina, who has been able to bear sons and therefore complies with what society expects, used to provoke Hannah severely to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. Imagine Hannah being provoked, prodded and poked for not being able to produce an heir. Imagine the heartache and the depression she must have felt and experienced. Imagine not being able to fight back to stop the taunting. Penina had several children and she used that against Hannah as if she somehow was in charge of her own reproductive capabilities. Do we consider ourselves blessed? I suppose Penina did because Hannah wasn't. And do we do the same towards people who are not blessed according to our standards? We may not use words but it's in our attitudes and how our society works. Penina's children are Hannah's condemnation. She is shamed by her barrenness. Hannah wept and could not, would not maybe eat under all the duress from this co-wife. In our day, I want us to acknowledge too how often we can be insensitive to those who need and desire social standing and safety. In this text, it's the social standing and security that having a child brings women. But there are other ways that we can be callous about people. We can be callous to poor people. We, be we can be callous towards rich people. We think, well, where did you get your money from? Or unemployed people, we could say, they should get a job. Or people who fail exams, or well, they should have worked harder, studied harder. We always see through things through our own eyes, through our own world view, and we judge. That's what Eli did, that's what Elkanah did, and that's what Penina did. Remember from the Speaking of Life where Greg says that the underdog has to walk a tightrope. He said this, there has to be loss, risk, a tightrope the un underdog finally makes it across into the promised land. Remember also that a woman could not speak for herself in those days, but Hannah petitions on her own behalf and does what it takes physically and ritually to try and have a child. She walks the tightrope to get to her promised land. There's nothing in the text that indicates that Hannah speaks back to either Penina or Elkanah. She instead presents herself humbly to God. She holds her peace before her family, even though she is hurting, and as she would say later to Eli, a bleak-spirited woman, or it could be translated deeply troubled, or a woman with a wounded spirit. She directs her grief and lament in prayer to the God of heaven, the God of wombs and women. I'm deeply aware that there are women in our times who have prayed and have spent thousands, hundreds of thousands of rands on in vitro fertilization, IVF, and other methods in order to have a child and still don't have one. I grieve with those who can't have a child. I grieve with those who haven't had miscarriages. I had two. And in those days, there was no counselling. There was no concept of, well, we need to talk this through. I dealt with it the best I could. And I still cry when I hear of others who have lost. We need to honour the grief and realise that we never, ever really get over it. We don't move on. We take our experiences with us 
live with them and it makes us who we are to this day. After Hannah had ritually offered a sacrifice and promised to lend her child to God, she returns full and eats for the first time. We might realise the fact that it's still a patriarchal desire that she's yielded to, but Hannah was a woman of her time, just as I'm a woman of my time. But I'm getting off track. What's this sermon really all about? It's about Hannah suffering and the people who should have loved her. It's about the faith she had in God to persevere in prayer, despite the long, long wait. We read it was years in the text. But I think it's also a lesson about how we treat others, how especially we treat the underdog. Who are the underdogs in our lives? Whom do we judge? Whom do we look down upon? My dad, granddaughter had a nasty experience at school this week. After school, Michaela went to the lady who keeps the uniform shop at the school. The way the shopkeeper spoke to her made her very upset and her heart ache. You need to make an appointment, she said. Your parents must park at the top. And it was such a horrible tone, Michaela cried. She's only a child. This woman doesn't speak to the parents like that. The parents bring the money. Just because Michaela is a child doesn't give anyone the right to be rude and nasty. Michaela was the underdog and she deserved a little respect as she learns the rules of the shop within the school. The beggars at the traffic lights are underdogs and it's really hard not to be rude when they're right in the way, right in the middle of the road. You're already negotiating traffic and now you have a human being to drive around. What they're doing is illegal. But like Hannah, I guess they're sometimes desperate. So for me, even if I'm not going to give them any money, I must treat them with respect. I must, and I don't. They irritate me and they worry me because I'm trying to drive. But I hope these words will go into, into my heart and I can change. And when we're on the other side, when we become the underdog, we experience the pain. We become the underdog when we're ignored. For a sensitive person like me, you'd be hurt if you were ignored. You would go to someone and say, hi, how are you today? And they just ignore you. That's hurtful. It hurts when we're passed by, not noticed, not spoken to. It's hard sometimes not to lash out, isn't it? There are many stories of underdogs in the Bible, not just the woman who cried out for a baby. There's blind Bartimaeus. Mary, when she found she was pregnant, Joseph, in the Old Testament, the underdog of his brothers. What about Dinah, Jacob's sister, who was terribly abused? All victims, all underdogs. And God knows, and he cares. Children are often underdogs, yet how many times have we watched a child around us and astound us with their faith, with something that they said in a prayer, and we go, wow. We heard at the beginning of this lesson that faith and trust in God are more important than any trust we place in human beings, even powerful human beings. However, it's not our faith that we trust in. It is the faith of Jesus. When we live in Jesus, we will want to show respect. We will want to love as God loves us. And when we don't want to, we can turn to him like Hannah did. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words you preserved for us today. We thank you for the example of Hannah, a woman of her time, who did this amazing thing she did going to you when she was so upset and so, for so many years, but she persevered. Father, we have similar problems of how people are treated in our world today. Around the elections, bitter words are spoken and people are, are horrible to each other. Let us learn from this not to be like Peninnah, not to be like Elkanah, and not to be like Eli, Eli, and not judge. And we pray with the help of the Holy Spirit, we will be changed. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Goodbye. was a single mother. She was abandoned by the family she belonged to. And there in the wilderness with her son, alone, with very little provision, she was wondering. She was questioning. Does anyone care? She's crying now. The desert. She's lost in her despair. She thinks nobody loves her. Hey, God thinks nobody's there. But God says, I. Savior will be born through you to free the world from 
from sin And he'll make all things new for you And love you back to life again Again And then From Ruth Who gave birth to a son Obed Who gave birth to a son Jesse Who gave birth to a son Named David Now this same once shepherd boy Mighty warrior Anointed king Is alone Terrified In the darkness He's hiding in the desert He's battling despair David thinks his life is over, it's over And God, he doesn't care But God says, I will be the rock of your salvation In the hour of your deepest need, you'll find that I am near. I am here, and I will be a ring of fire around you, and I will be the glory in your midst and the power. He said 